Hello there, it's Jay here from Jay's Vintage Junk. Now, it's not a uh, repair video this, this is just a quick uh, video to say I've um, I've moved locations. So I've moved back to my old um, repair locations here. Basically, um, as you know, I um, this is where I started out doing my YouTube videos. Um, this little um, this little workbench here. Um, but I uh, went up into the attic because I had more room up there. Um, I actually built a little bit of a studio with some better lights and what have you up in the attic. Um, unfortunately, I lost um, one of my um, storage units. Um, and it was a storage unit that technically I wasn't actually paying any um, rent for. I couldn't really say anything about it. And I can't really justify rent on another storage unit. So all the stuff that I had in there basically had to go um, up into the attic. Um, so hence why I don't film up there anymore. It's basically it's packed with um, boxes full of interesting bits of vintage electronics and all sorts of stuff, some audio stuff, all sorts of stuff um, up there, like I said. So I, in the interim, thought I'll just make do with uh, working in my office. Unfortunately, it's becoming a bit of a pain, that, because I do use that office for other things. I have my main computer set up in there. Um, it's where I do, do, do work, basically. Um, and it meant that every time I had a project set up on the desk and I actually had to do something that wasn't related to filming, working on a vintage computer or anything. I had to clear everything away, set the computer back up as a workstation and do whatever I was doing and then move everything again. So I thought I might as well come back to my um, original position but I've hopefully made it a little bit better than it was um, previously. It does also have the advantage that I can actually have the camera on either side of uh, where I'm working because in my office, um, because I've basically got a radiator and a window right on one side of me, I could only ever have the camera on the left hand side of me as we have it here now. Um, in here I can actually have it on the right hand side as well which does make things um, considerably easier for um, filming stuff. Um, I haven't got all my equipment set up in here yet, but I've got the basics. I've got all my soldering, desoldering stuff, and I'm quite pleased. I'll, I'll take basically. I'll give you a quick show of how I've got this all set up for now. And like I said, I do have a little. I don't have a huge amount more room, but I do have a little bit more room. I've got some hopefully decent lighting. Another thing, one reason for doing this video is so I can play it back and just see how the lighting looks, whether it's bright enough. Again, something I struggled with a little bit in my office was um, getting some decent lighting, like on the board or something. I was using some desk lamps, and I didn't really have a great place to put them. So um, lighting was always a bit of a um, bit of an issue in there. Um, on this bench, it's already set up with um, LED um, strip lighting all the way. I'll just see if I can tilt you up so I don't know if you can see it or not. But all the way around here is um, LED tape. So it gives, and it goes all the way around the bench um, to the front of it as well. So it does give a really nice light spread. Um, so hopefully that'll be okay for filming. Obviously, I can bring extra lighting if I need, but it's quite a nice light to work with. This, um, so I'm, I'm pleased that I've got a better light in here anyway. Um, so I'll show you also power um, in my office. I was struggling with just one little four-way strip on the floor that I was trying to plug soldering irons into, and the computers I was working on, and um, things like that. Um, obviously, here I've got. Let me tilt you up a little bit and show you. Cause, I mean, you've seen this before. I've got a decent um, amount of sockets here. And the entire bench, the lights, everything are isolated with one isolation switch. So I can literally leave everything as it is and just power off with one switch if I need be. Um, obviously, everything here is individually switched. What I have done, um, I've added an extra four-way, actually, from last, um, last time I used this. If we look over here now... I don't think I can zoom you out any further, unfortunately, but no, I can't get the camera any further back at the moment. But basically, we've got um, a desoldering, full desoldering set up here. So we've got my new um, desoldering station. We've actually, I did have to brave into the attic to get some of my um, stuff. Um, that wasn't fun. Uh, about four hours of moving boxes just to get from one end of the attic to the other. Um, but I did manage to retrieve my um, desoldering. 
proper soldering iron, um, temperature controlled soldering iron. Um, also, behind my soldering bits, we've got my um, hot air rework station. Obviously, they're all cheapy cheapy, but they do the job very very nicely for for the you know for what I do really. Obviously, I'm super pleased. I know I've only just um, got that at Christmas, but I am super pleased with that um, desoldering station for what it cost. And even my soldering iron is not an expensive one. It was about 30 quid or something like that, 25 quid. I mean, there's not much over 100 pounds worth of equipment there. Perhaps 120 pounds worth of equipment new, all in um, in my stuff. It's not expensive. To get started, Rave, you know, I mean, you don't need all this stuff to get started, but if you want to get a little bit more into it and you do want better than just a manual solder pump and things like that, this stuff isn't hugely expensive. It is within most normal means budget. Like I say, it's not top quality, but it does the job. Uh, so I've got all that set back up here. Um, I managed to get one of my, um, I found that in the attic as well, it's one of my better um, cheapy meters. I do quite like that one. Um, last time I used it, I must admit, I think I stopped using it because it was reading um, a bit funny. It turns out it just had a flat battery, I put a brand new battery in it and it, um, it's perfect, it's, it works nicely that. Um, so I'm going to use that as my um, bench meter for now. The main reason I'm going to keep this one as my bench meter, just for the moment, it's quite nice for filming because... Um, it has a continuity buzzer on it, which, you know, it picks up all right on camera. And uh, if it's actually needed, it does actually have a backlight on the um, display as well, and it fades itself out. So I've got that for um, set up for now for actual meter readings. I do have all my other test gear. I've actually um, been sensible, because I'm always scrabbling about not being able to find the gear I need at the time. So got a couple of these um, fly cases. I use one of these to keep all my hand tools in, um, you know, my pliers, screwdrivers, things like this. And they had another one of them, so what I've done basically, we have all my test equipment. So we've got some extra meters in here, we've got my little pocket scope, we've got a logic probe, um, that logic analyzer, um, component analyzer, and then various test leads to connect them all up all together in there I would like to see if I can get a hold of a couple more of these um, flight cases, they are really nice these uh, they are quite expensive though, that one was an absolute steal, I got that off a um, car boot sale for about 8 quid um, and there's my other one they are basically identical. That one um, I got many, many years ago. Um, it actually had a, um, a Russian camera, a Zenit, um, still film camera. Um, the camera, the case, um, some lenses and everything. I think I paid about a fiver for the whole lot. I think I threw the camera away because it was seized up. Um, I think I kept the lenses actually. I think I used lenses on some other things. Um, but I, obviously really nice case so I've got all my tools all set up where I'm quite happy with them you know they're uh, I can actually find things now because I am a bit of a um, bit of a bugger for losing stuff basically so I've got all my uh, all my tools and all my test gear now set properly I've sorted myself out a um, another test monitor I mean you've seen this monitor before um, it's one, this is one of the monitors I used to use really early on when I started doing videos. It's one that I picked up from, I think it was off a market stall or, um, yeah, I think it was a flea market stall. Um, and it was just after um, analog TV had been shut off, and I think I paid a fiver for it. And it is a really early um, 14 inch flat panel display. And it's a bit of an oddball actually. Because it had a, t a um, floor stand for it, and I've got the remains of the floor stand here actually. I'll show you. Ooh. It had a floor stand like that. But the TV fit on there, and the majority of the floor stand was behind the TV with just a little bit sticking out at the front. Which meant you couldn't really you know, put it right back and um, 
you know, it still stuck out from the wall too much. So what I did, I noticed on the back of it, it had um, the holes for a VESA mount. Um, so I thought, oh, easy enough, just flip the, um, unscrew the bottom and um, I'll wall mount it. Uh, it turns out, even though it had the holes for the VESA mount, um, there was no real way of actually taking the base off uh, without actually completely dismantling the whole bloody monitor. Uh, which is what I ended up doing. I basically took the whole thing apart, uh, disassembled the um, base out of it. And the base actually had a big piece of um, quite like one mil thick steel in the bottom there, all milled out. You have to give the base some weight. So what I did, I don't know if you can perhaps just see that just at the top there. Um, basically, I got it and I um, marked where the VESA holes um, were on it. I took it down into the um, garage, used my pillar drill, and I drilled out the VESA holes and um, some holes in the top to screw it to my um, backboard there. I then found out that the, although the VESA spacings and everything were correct, um, they were a really weird screw that they'd used. It weren't like a standard uh, metric, like an M4. I think it's usually M4 on them small ones. Uh, it was something real and ob w re weird and oddball. Anyway, fortunately, what I found was the screws that made up the hinges on the base there actually fit that um, that thread pitch that was used in the dresser bracket. So I pinched the um, screws that held the like the adjusters basically for the tilt on the um, base, I took all that apart, took the four screws out and used them to mount the uh, plate on the back there and got it uh, wall mounted so that flush right back against my wall. And I've just found something out that was really really nice about this monitor. Um, one thing that was a bugger with it, um, all the connections are on the bottom there so it would be a real pain to keep trying to fiddle up to connect up to it. So you've seen me build this before. Um, I'll just zoom you in. Cause you, like I say, you've seen these before, but I've just done one little adaptation to this. You can see there, this is one of my um, little composite RGB switches. You've, have a look back in my videos quite a while and you'll see a video of me actually building, um, building one of these. All it does is basically it uses a um, USB, 5 volt USB, which is... Um, point you up to it. I've got a little 5 volt um, USB adapter there. That connects in through a little voltage regulator to that switch there and that just goes to the switching pin on the SCART and um, what it means is if you can make a basically you can make a really simple RGB lead up for a computer where you're just using like your ground, your sink, your RGB um, connect it into there and actually use that switch to switch the um, television from composite into RGB mode to um, display on the telly. Obviously without that you'd have to find 5 volts inside the computer and then run that through a resistor, run it all the way up your video cable to um, switch the telly between composite and RGB. That just allows you to do it on the fly like that. But what I did, because this thing, like I said, is a bit of a pain, it's only got one Skype connector inside there and I think an S-Video um, connector and VGA. There's a VGA in there which I've run down into underneath my bench so if I ever want to put a computer under there. Um, but all I've done to add to it, I've just put a composite um, input and left and right audio on the front there. So I can easily, easily just plug in any computer that I'm uh, working on. Um, composite or I can use a SCART lead and um, RGB to SCART and like I say I just flick that and it'll switch the, the monitor into um, RGB mode. But let me zoom you out again and we'll get back onto this uh, monitor because one thing that I found that's really cool is like I say it's a cheap log um, logic I think it is. I think that's probably one of the, like the supermarket home brandy type things. And I've actually, I've completely disabled the TV tuner in this, basically. When I had to dismantle it, I actually had to take the TV tuner module out to get the back off. And I just didn't bother putting it back back in. There's no point. It's an analogue TV tuner and we don't really need analogue TV on it. So like I, said, I just deleted that out of the, um, out of the monitor when I uh, took it apart. But I found something really, um, really interesting about it. And that... We just get this. Um, this is that little uh, MyPad 80, which I promise you I will get some more videos um, 
up because the case is finished. I just need to transplant this into the uh, little joystick that I built. But this is that little MyPad 18. If you remember, um, it only outputs NTSC. Now this um, monitor, if you look in the menus on it, it says it's a PAL monitor. But if we switch this on, we've got colour. Oops, we've also got Chinese, that's not much good to me. <laughs> Let's go down to there. Let's turn the volume down as well. But yeah, um, as you can see, we've, it actually works in... Um, it actually works in... It's got <laughs> lots of really crap, um, crap not uh, right games on this, but uh, you never know. So it looks like it's actually, uh, well we know because I've um, also had my Amiga plugged up it and um, it works fine in PAL as well. So it's a really really good little test monitor because it will um, do PAL and NTSC. Which is really odd because actually when you go in the menu system on it, it only tells you that it's a, uh, um, it's PAL. I think, I think we can get that up on here, yeah. If we go um, onto there. And we got it's like that one. I can't remember now. I also can't remember how um, I got it up now. But anyway, you can get into a, like a sub menu on it, and it tells you that it's um, PAL, and it won't let you change that anyway. But for some reason, I don't know if it's because I pulled the tuner out of it or what. But for some reason, it. Um, actually works is um, PAL and NTSC which is really nice, like I said it's really nice as a um, test monitor that. So yeah basically that is my, uh, I would say I'm going to have to bring other things down here and um, what have you, I've even got room up there um, I've got room up there to put some of my um, equipment drawers which I have, I've pulled them out of the attic I just haven't put them, um, I haven't put them in here yet also, to one of my viewers who was asking, yes, I have managed to pull out um, some of my 8-bit Atari stuff. I managed to find the, um, a disk drive and a couple of 8-bit um, Ataris. So, um, I will do a video on doing a little bit of 8-bit Atari work for you. So, uh, <laughs> just, to, uh, just, to inform, just to let you know that, yeah, I did manage to dig, dig that um, stuff out. So, I will, can't promise it'll be like this week, but I will um, do something with some 8-bit Ataris. Um, getting a bit long this video. I'll just show you. Basically, as well as having all this set up here, the other other nice thing about having this set up, this is also where I have um, like my um, actual systems that I use on a semi-regular basis um, set up. So I'll just give you a little uh, little bit of bonus, a little bit of um, a look at what basically what I'm um, playing and gaming on at the moment. And these do change to some extent. You know, I do pull one out, swap one out, put something else in its position, and. Um, have a bit of a change round, but um, hopefully I can just bring you over and I'll sh like I said, I'll show you what I'm um, currently, I've got, currently got set up and what I'm currently um, playing with. So we'll uh, just bring you, we'll bring you across a bit. Oops, hopefully this won't go too wrong. I should really just pause the camera and um, do some proper editing and what have you, but uh, I can't be bothered. Right, there we go, so basically I'll bring you a bit further around. What we've got for first, we've got my um, Amiga 600. This is my like go-to everyday um, Amiga 600. Um, <coughs> I have got all, yeah, I've got quite a few other Amigas. Um, I just like this set for this setup because of its size. You know, the 600 is a nice, compact little um, computer. Um, it's fairly standard this one. I am going to be doing some videos because it has started to have a few issues. Um, basically this is, as I got it, um, I probably got this in early 2000s, it's a car boot find. Um, I've not done really anything to it apart from um, when I got it someone had hacked in um, I think it were either a 720k or a 1.4 from a piece, a modified PC floppy drive, to replace the uh, what obviously the failed um, original Amiga drive. 
and unfortunately they had hacked up the they've cut the case out at the side there to um, fit the PC drive. What I've done is I've swapped that out and I've actually got a GoTech, um, so I can just point it round there. Um, I think I did a video on me um, installing this in here um, some time ago, but basically I've got a GoTech in it now, and I've got a four gig stick in there with all the games that I'm currently playing on the Amiga just in there so, so it's nice and simple um, just for a bit of retro Amiga um, gaming it's brilliant but um, I think some of the caps are starting to go in this now um, like I said, it hasn't been recapped by me and I'm, I'm certain it wasn't recapped before I got it because like I said it were a car boot purchase um, the audio is starting to go a little bit funny and I can't, I mean I only use this currently just on a composite output into uh, this TV that I've got here um, but even so the composite output I'm getting out of it is not as good as I remember it used to be and I know it's not the TV because I use this TV with other consoles and it's absolutely spot on um, so like I said this is one that's going to have to have a um, bit of a look at in the future I'm toying with the idea of perhaps putting a hard disk in it as well um, it doesn't like I say it doesn't have a hard drive in it at the moment I know that these won't really do uh, like WHD load and stuff like that they haven't got the uh, power here you really need an accelerated 1200 to make the full advantages of um, WHD load I do have, <laughs> actually do have an accelerated 1200 up in the attic but um, that's buried away at the moment. I will eventually have that dug out and set up but when I've got somewhere more better than this to actually uh, have it set up but for the moment like I said, I'm quite happy using this um, Amiga 600 um, as well as the um, 600 I've got I'm going through a bit a little bit of a uh, I'll move you move you across again oops I'm going through a little bit of a Sega um, revival gate you know phase at the moment so I've got my um, Mega Drive and my Master System um, set up. And so we've got a Mega Drive One here, um, modified Mega Drive One. Um, it's got the um, 50 60 hertz uh, mod on it. It's got the um, region, you know, the um, Japanese language mod on it, and things like that. Um, again, apart from that, it's fairly standard. It's just um, I just prefer it like so you can get the extra little bit of speed out of it flicking it into the um, 60 hertz uh, mode and um, that telly that telly um, works if that let's fire the telly up I'll fire the telly up and I'll fire the uh, mega drive up so you can just see um, see what it's like for me what I uh, how I play my games Ooh, let me get around the other side of the camera so I can, uh, I can flip the power back on that's that one and it's that one the bottom one being the Amiga power supply so I think we should be on there oh, I was playing the, um, just bear with me a second, I was playing the um, master system last, I've just got one power supply um, connected up that I use between the two because basically it's the same power supply Plug that in. There we go. And they should come straight on. There we go. That's not too bad. So yeah, that's my um, that's my Mega Drive all um, set up, and then I've just got the Master System, the Master System set up as well. And so I just swap the um, power between the two. Nice thing about that telly is it's got um, I think it's got three SCAR inputs on the back. It's got a um, HDMI and it's got a um, composite on it as well, so I can have them all basically plugged in and just. That's RGB, that's RGB, and it switches between the two, so whichever one you power up the monitor just switches um, to whichever one. That's standard apart from, it's got a um, 
50 60 hertz switch on the side of it and we look on the back it's quite modified on the rear um, we've got RGB output there and then obviously we've got composite and left and right or, well it's just mono isn't it, we've got audio out there composite out but we do have full RGB I modded it for full RGB out there so yeah, it's not one for the purists that but um, there are a lot of these Master System 2's out there I like it because um, it's compact, it's a little bit smaller than the uh, Master System 1. I do have a nice condition Master System 1 that that's in storage at the moment. This I just prefer on here and um, this one's got Alex Kidd as the built-in game which I quite like just playing when I'm... <laughs> I just want to play a game and not think about it really so um, that's why that's um, there. These do get swapped out for other systems so the Amiga actually tends to um, my 600 tends to basically stay there for the simple fact that I can just pull the USB stick out, I can stick that in the laptop, stick a load of um, Amiga stuff on there, shove it in and I don't have to think about it, you know, it's it's there ready to play and um, I think you know, there's 50 games on that USB stick, it's not that full um, and it works well with uh, it works well with that monitor I found that on the, uh, this is one that I found on the side of the street um, literally it was just dumped on one of the um, embankments around here and I threw it in the back of, um, back of my vehicle I got it on fully expecting it to be faulty and have to do some repair work on it um, I was actually hoping I'd be able to, you know, I actually threw it in the van um, thinking oh it's something I can do a video on seeing if I can repair it uh, <laughs> when I plugged it in there's bugger all wrong with it there's absolutely nothing wrong with it I've been using it for well over 12 months now and it's been absolutely perfect I'm saying all it gets used for is um, my consoles and what have you um, in here anyway I'm going to leave it there for now like I say I hope you enjoyed what's well, basically just a little um, updatey rambly video I will be getting back on with the bead now um, ASAP like I said now I've got this this area set up um, it should be working on the uh, beeb a lot easier because I can actually leave it set up on the bench um, not having to worry about it while I um, do other things not having to worry I'll have to clear it away because I need to use the um, desk and the computer for other things anyway like I said, I'm going to leave it there for now I hope you enjoyed this little rambly update so uh, thanks for watching and goodbye <laughs>